to literary lunch, and uh, I hope that you'll have an opportunity to read Jane Brock's book, Silence. It's marvelous. Um, I feel, I could feel as I read the book, there I go, um, the world expanding nudge that comes from a new point of view. It reminded me of art classes. You probably had one where you walked in and the teacher said, you know, draw this, and then said, wait a second, there's a catch. You can only draw the negative space. Mm -hmm. And you thought, oh, well, you won't be able to see what's going on. But of course, understanding the negative space meant expanding and a deeper understanding of what you were looking at. And Jane has really given that to us in exploring silence. We pay a lot of attention to words, but if we didn't have the space between the words, they would be quickly become meaningless. And so she's really looked at the space between and what happens in that space both um, in uh, monastic tradition, as it's a chosen by the individual, but also the isolation of prison and solitary. So uh, my novel has some scenes where silence is a conspicuous component of the setting, but I'm really here as a Quaker from Portland Friends Meeting where we gather in silence every Sunday morning. Spoken messages, if there are any, are given when someone feels led by the Spirit to share. Every week we have visitors to meeting. Some people find it torture to sit there for an hour and say nothing, and others comment that they feel like they've come home that the silence uh, welcomed them in in a way that they had not met in other places. So um, how did you decide to explore both sides of this experience of silence? Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, I, um, I first began, my first thought of writing this book came in 2001 when I visited a monastery in the south of France called Sinan. And I was really just uh, astounded by the silence there and the architecture built for silence. But I didn't, I didn't know how to handle the material. I couldn't imagine writing a book that would um, add anything to the long history of books about monastic silence. And um, so, but over the years, it stayed in the back of my mind. And then I happened to visit Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia about six or seven years ago, and which was the first use of the silent and solitary confinement for um, criminal justice. And it was meant to, it was based on the monastic idea of the cell, and it was meant as a means of redemption. So, and walking through there and looking at the cells, which were so much like a, a monk cell, all of a sudden, I began to see how I could write a book that oscillates between these two architectures. Mm -hmm. I will say it also played into my limitations as a writer because I knew I couldn't write a book that was that talked about silence in an abstract way. Yeah. So that the architecture of silence, uh, the architecture of these places, helped me to ground my discussion of silence in the real world. Um, so, uh, as you think about the you, the um, work you did looking at um, the monastic tradition of silence, do you feel like, are there pieces of that that you thought um, might be particularly intriguing uh, for modern readers? <laughs> Well, the great challenge was to find the shape of the book and find the shape of the discussion about silence because there could be a thousand books written about silence, and there are. And I was really 
I, uh, my take on it was um, very particular to these two places. So yeah. I kept reading and reading, and you know, my method of writing is to just try to take in everything and then whittle things down. And you know, it's gallons of wash for the pure drop, as the poet Seamus Heaney said. So I, um, I found myself circling back to Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. whom I had read in my 20s yeah. and had read sporadically ever since for 40 years. And I realized that his experience of silence was so complex and it um, was a real argument with silence in many ways. Yeah. And I found that that, I, I ended up honing in on that just be, because of the richness of it. Yeah. And it helped me to situate it in the monastery, but ground it in the experience of one real um, person who grappled with it over decades. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and the book really does, I think, a remarkable job of of using his rich language, because it's so hard to find ways to articulate <laughs> the, the, the uh, challenges of silence, and and uh, and he he's such a great writer too. Right, right. Um, but you've really woven that in with um, pieces from very old monastic writing about silence as right. well. So. Yeah. You really get uh, covered as very much sort of the scope because Mer well, when was Merton writing? Well, he wrote in the mid 20th century. He entered the monastery on the eve of World War II, and that, that informed his life. Yeah. But you know, what one of the things that really struck me in doing that research was, you know, people have been searching for silence for century upon century, and that the search in the third century was not. Um, in many ways different from the search in the 20th or the 21st century. So I, I did want to give a sense of that. We always think that, oh, we need more silence now. But even in the much quieter world of the Desert Fathers, the much quieter world of the 12th century monasteries in the early Middle Ages, they needed silence as much as we need it now. Yeah. So that's, it says something, I think, about silence to even yeah. ponder that search over the many centuries. Yeah. I think one of my uh, favorite stories from the Desert Father, which I think about sometimes when someone's visiting meeting, and I look and I think, I don't know what their experience of this is. And um, there was uh, one of the um, Desert Fathers who uh, his um, he was sort of off in the desert a little ways, and a visitor, who was a very important person, came and visited the disciples and said, I want to talk to this guy. And so the disciples run off to the desert father and say, oh, you've got to come see this guy. He's really important. And he says, well, like, I'm not going to talk to him today. I'll talk to him tomorrow. And this goes on for several days, and finally, the very important person goes off in a huff. And the disciples go to him and say, to the father and say, what was that, you know, why didn't you see this very important person? You could have influenced the world and made the world a better place. And he says, well, uh, if my silence didn't speak to him, my words would mean nothing. Uh, we also want to talk about the other element which is woven through the book and uh, I, as I read I was reminded of an experience I had last fall when my husband and I were on a trip in the Midwest and on a whim we decided we would go see the Hopewell Culture Natural Historic Park which is you know off in the middle of nowhere in southern Ohio, and uh, we turned down this little road, and suddenly we were confronted with the two biggest prisons I've ever seen in my life. Um, and they're really deliberately invisible. I mean, I was just so struck that 
here were these huge prisons with thousands and thousands of people locked inside, but no, it wasn't like they were on a highway where people would drive by and talk about it. And um, uh, that really is connected. What's going on right now with prisons is really connected to the origins. Uh, can you talk more about where, did, where did, how did we get started on this? Well, the idea for the penitentiary, for Eastern State Penitentiary, was um, uh, the concept of Benjamin Rush, one of our founding fathers in the late 18th century. And at that time, um, the new United States was looking for a means of, um, a new means of criminal justice to replace the hangings and brandings of the past and to distinguish themselves from the European system of criminal justice. And they wanted something that was not only, they were looking for something more humane, but also something that wasn't quite so public. Um, the jails at the time were located in the middle of cities and they were very chaotic and people could go up to the window and you know, just talk to the people who were incarcerated. The hangings and brandings and whippings were very public. So Eastern State Penitentiary was eventually built on the outskirts of Philadelphia on, um, where there had been an old farm. So it was three miles outside mm -hmm. of the city of Philadelphia. So it was the first instance of separating prisoners. Yeah. And within the penitentiary, each prisoner was in their cell, was escorted to their cell in a hood so as to disorient them within the prison so they would never know where they were. And each prisoner was, they were, get, they were granted access to um, spiritual advisors, but they couldn't contact their family. They were not to speak unless instructed to. They were not to make any noise. Um, and they didn't, they didn't, they were fed in their cells. They didn't have any communication with, even, with any of the other prisoners. So there is a direct line from that world of the penitentiary to solitary today, although it's very different, different in scale and different in intent. The, uh, the prisoners in Eastern State Penitentiary were, um, those were sentences meted out by the criminal justice system, which, and that is no longer the case now. Um, solitary confinement is um, punishment within the punishment of the system. Yeah. But I think you said in your book, no one is sentenced to solitary confinement. <laughs> yeah. No one, yeah, because it's, it's um, the idea of sentencing to people, sentencing people to solitary confinement was done away with um, in the early 20th century. But um, it's interesting, I use the experience of prisoner number one, Charles Williams, yeah. to, um, to almost be the, it's the opposite of Thomas Merton's experience. It's the imposed experience rather than the chosen. But the challenge was Thomas Merton left hundreds of thousands of words for me to wade through, and Charles Williams was mute. And the only records we have of his experiences are through um, observers who visited the prison or the prison records themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Which included Charles Dickens. I was, yeah. I was yeah. interested in that. Yeah. The, um, you do you have found a. Um, a, a person who wrote extensively about her experience of, of silence in prison with Ginsburg. Right. Eugenia Ginsburg, who um, was um, swept up in the Great Purge, Stalin's Great Purge. And I came across her because of, uh, again, the writing presented its own challenges. And um, I was stumped as to where to go with Charles Williams' experience, but then it occurred to me. It's the same experience all over the world for almost two yeah. centuries, these yeah. people who have been committed to solitary. Yeah. Eugenia Ginsburg's cell was remarkably similar to Charles Williams' cell over 100 years prior. Yeah. And, but she wrote a memoir of her experience after getting, 20 years after, she was in solitary for 10 years and then spent 10 years in Siberia and then wrote this memoir of her time there. Um, she was a very different personality and brought something very different to the cell. 
which was also interesting. I mean, it's not the same experience for everybody. It's a challenge to endure, but different people endure it differently. Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the um, topics which you actually give a whole um, chapter to and, um, and is woven through some other parts of the book, looking at women in silence. And uh, I, was, I was reminded of a friend of mine was telling me about her father, who was a very prominent person, and um, he, at home he was abusive to his wife and his kids. And one time when his wife was in the hospital, she actually said she hadn't fallen down the stairs. And they, um, so they recommended uh, marriage counseling. Uh, the psychiatrist uh, recommended that her mother take up knitting so that she would stop provoking her husband. Um, so this is really, um, in addition to being horrifying, is actually part of a very long tradition. Right. Um, it, it struck me both in the penitentiary and the monastery that the experience of silence for women is emphatically different from the experience of silence for men, um, in part because there's a whole another layer of meaning uh, for silence um, that women experience, and that goes way back to the punishments for gossiping, for, um, or speaking too much in public for women. The gossips in um, 16th century England, for instance, could be um, bridled for not, um, for not, for speaking in public or, or for seeming to nag too much. This was the same in colonial America. In colonial America, they were dunked into the into a pond repeatedly. Yeah. Um, in England, they were often put a, a metal um, shield was put over their head, and a bit was put into their mouth, to, and they were paraded through the streets. It was a severe and humiliating punishment in both instances, and that also it it um, you know that shaming came in through the even into the because there was no place for women in the original design of the penitentiary, in part because women were not women who transgressed were thought not capable of redemption. And the penitentiary was supposed to be a means for redemption. So women were treated differently even in society in society um, for that transgression. And in the monastery, women, this wasn't always the case, but often the case. The convents were much poorer than the, than the monasteries, and they were often, um, uh, they, women in the convents had much less freedom than monks had. So the, 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 the order within the, 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 um, the monastic tradition was also very different. But it's intriguing to me in the Middle Ages, um, I look at a group of, um, nuns in southern France who, it, we can't know what they thought, but it may have been that that confinement, even in their poverty, even in being crowded, they found more freedom than they could in society. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really interesting question to bring up. I mean, I think in the book I didn't want to answer questions, I wanted to present these situations yeah. And, yeah. and let the reader think about them because there, some of these things are unanswerable. We can't know what they were thinking in that convent in the 13th century. Yeah. Um, I've recently been reading Braiding Sweetgrass and Gathering Moss by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, both of these books, which are also nonfiction, include details on plants from her knowledge as a botanist but that's almost background to her own stories as a mother and an indigenous person. In silence, your own experience is almost a whisper by contrast. How did you decide how much of you 
to include in the book? Well, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, I think it goes back to really my first books about my family farm were a personal narrative mm -hmm. backed up by history. And then when I came to write Brilliant, one of the challenges of Brilliant I, I gave myself as a writer, I said, I want to take the first person out of the narrative, but I want to create a voice that seems intimate. And so that was not kind of a, 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 a challenge I gave myself as a writer. Yeah. And, I can, and I thought, well, all right, I did that. I don't have to do that again. <laughs> so, but I, I wanted to, I just felt as I worked on the material over the six or seven years, that I wanted, even though I had a very personal connection to the search for silence in a way, I wanted, I, I wanted to keep myself in the background. So I'm more of a questioner and a wanderer who pops up at times than anything else. I, it wasn't about my personal story, it was about this um, phenomenon that was out in the world. So I thought it, it seems right to keep myself in the background. Yeah. So, um, so I, yeah, so um, I want to give you a chance to hear um, from Jane read from her book. So. I'll just read a few paragraphs. Um, this is a great challenge to hold the microphone and read at the same time. But um, and this is actually, um, I do come in with a very personal story at the end of uh, my first experience of sort of dealing with a large silence when I was in my early 20s <laughs> and living on my own on Nantucket Island. Um, way out on the edge of the island one winter. And this is, um, but that winter was also my first serious attempt at, ri at the writing life. And I think those days allowed me to glean an understanding of what was possible in silence. I believe now that the time in Squam gave me the freedom to begin, and once I'd begun to work intently, it also gave me room to inquire into the life that I had hoped for and allowed me to make large decisions. I think I was more daring with my choices than I otherwise might have been. Mm -hmm. The silence may have been unsought to begin with, but it became a complex part of my life after a while. I grew to love the days when I could so intently focus on my work, grew to love the long walks in that austere landscape, and the continuity, continuity of thought that silence allowed. I also feared it at times. It could seem like a test, and I wondered the same things the world always wonders about silence. Was it, an, was it an avoidance, an escape? And then I'll just skip to the end of that chapter. Silence can seem like a luxury, or the fraught world has labeled it that way. But from what I know of it, I would argue that silence is as necessary as the constitutionally guaranteed freedom of speech that we so carefully guard and endlessly ponder. For it affirms the meaning of speech, even as it provides a path to inner life, to beauty and observation and appreciation. It presents the opportunity for a true reckoning with the self, with external obligation, and with power. As much as we need silence, it needs us. It needs more than a few hundred monasteries where a few thousand souls guard most of what's left of it. Like all else threatened by our onslaught, it must be attended to and valued, given space and time in which to gain strength again. And the stronger the silence, the more it will be able to withstand the noise and distractions of our world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got some time for questions, if we've, if we've got a few questions. To the prisoners who in, who came out, it was difficult. It's difficult for all prisoners in forced silence and solitude against their will. Um, those who survive it best 
find a means of discipline. Um, whether Eugenia Ginsburg, for instance, used the time to um, recall all the things she had read, and she found that in the silence and solitude, her memory of books she had read came back to her almost completely. And that she, she used the time to write poetry in her head. And even when she was put in um, a dark cell, which was a punishment within the punishment, she knew she had to keep track of time. So every time they brought her bread and water, she would rend her shirt so that she could count the, the rips in her shirt and know how many days she had been in the um, cell. But for a lot of prisoners, for instance, um, there's evidence in, in, in the uh, Eastern State Penitentiary that some of them may have been, had entered already um, having cognitive disabilities. Quite a few of them um, left with cognitive disabilities or went mad in their cells or went crazy. They were given work and the, the, they, most of the prisoners loved the work for the structure it provided and depended on the work for a kind of sanity. Um, so it, it was a, a feat of endurance for all of them. Some of them um, survived it, some did not. Um, Charles Williams was let out of prison two years to the day after he was put in. He was given four dollars and his street clothes, and I couldn't find any trace of him after that. I mean, he was a young black man with a very common name, so he was um, lost to the world. Um, for, for monastics, nuns and um, priests who are in monasteries, you know, it's, it's often a challenge. A lot of postulants who enter do not end up leaving, but those who do stay and have chosen that life um, often find it very deep and rich. And um, Thomas Merton, I, I, you know, he had a special place in the in the monastery because he, he was also a famous writer. So that presented its own complexities, but he deeply valued the time he did have for the silence and regarded it as a richness. I, I think part of what you talk about in the book too is that for the monastic, that silence is a choice that's happening in community with the support of your community. And certainly that's part of you know, Quaker worship is, right. is its silence in community. And then if people want to do some reading, you've also got some modern psychiatrists looking at the damaging effects of modern solitude. So let's have another question. Yeah, um, I, what was the story, two quick questions, what was the story of Charles Williams, I don't know, and also just in terms of what happens in solitude, I guess we're just bringing that up, and the, I would assume the recidivism rate would be really high, whereas in places like Norway, where they, you know, treat, they, they treat prisoners really well, they have a, a practically normal life, except they're, like, maybe on an island cannot leave. Well, um, Charles Williams was an 18-year-old black farmer who was um, sentenced to two years in solitary uh, uh, and silent confinement for breaking into a house and stealing a gold key, a gold seal, and a gold watch. And um, he, was, um, he was brought to the jail. Uh, they, they had a whole ritual to bring him into the jail of bathing him, just as if you were entering a monastery, bathing him, cutting his hair, noting his scars, leading him to the cell, and then leading him to that world. Um, the, uh, the, I think the rate is, was very high. The rate, I mean, the, the, the prisoners who were in Eastern State Penitentiary in 1829 were largely drawn, as you can imagine, from uh, minorities and, Im and immigrants, what were known then as the dangerous classes. So um, even then, I think some of the aspects of prison were very similar to, to the aspects of prisons today in that sense. So it didn't really cure anybody. <laughs>
Um, I recently went on a writer's retreat with Main Writers and Publishers Alliance up in up north of the Grand Lake Stream, and I had this part of a poetry workshop with Stuart Keston now. And one of the exercises we did was to go for a walk in the woods as a group, and we were told nobody, has, nobody must say anything during this walk. So it was not a long period of silence. But it was incredible. I, all of us, I think, in the group found it a very powerful and deep experience sharing this silence in community. <coughs> and that kind of takes me to Thomas Merton and his choice to be in a community that was largely silence, and also to the choice of being in a Quaker meeting, where my experience of silence in, in a Quaker meeting is that the silence in community is a, is a very powerful thing and quite different from something like the, the silence of solitary confinement where you're not with people and you haven't chosen it. Or, uh, and I wonder if that's worth commenting on. Yeah, and even Thomas Merton he says at some point that um, the silence in the community was very distinct from the silence in the individual cell. That silence, in fact, isn't one... You know, that's one of the things I think I learned over the years of writing the book, that silence isn't this monolithic thing. Mm -hmm. That it has um, the silence I ex he experienced in his uh, individual cell or later in his hermitage was very different, say, than the silence of working with the other monastics together or worshiping with the other monastics together. And, you know, the silence within the... Um, the liturgical services was a way, in a way, served to enhance everything that was spoken, everything that was vocalized. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the music would have been nothing without the silence surrounding it. So it's a very, I mean, it's, I, it's a, such a complex and layered thing that um, to say it is one thing, or to say it's the absence of noise is really being very reductive. I mean, I did a lot of research on John Cage, and he never made it into the book except for an epigraph, <laughs> which he said, silence is not acoustic. It's a change of mind and turning around. <laughs> yes. was, the monastic, was the origin of monastic silence the abnegation of self or the communication with the deity or deity? That was a large part of it. It was to sort of lose yourself in the world and to, and to you know, be a vessel to allow the um, God to come in. You know, they would have said, for instance, um, they weren't looking out into the world. The light, the beautiful monastic, the light that comes in through the monastery was God looking at them, not them looking out into the world. Does that make sense? Yes, um, I was wondering whether you have been to the room at the United Nations in New York City, where there is a room of silence. No. Oh, well, it was during the way back the dog commercial was at the head, and he, I don't know if he demanded or he suggested that we should make a room. Oh, he says we all need silence in our lives. So there is a room there, right on the same on the first floor, you come in and you go in and there is a little sign that does tell you that this is the room for silence. In other words, you don't just go in and sit and whisper. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so I was just wondering whether you have in your own research on silence come upon other things, buildings maybe or so there. There might be a room of silence. Well, I mean, that's a wonderful idea. And certainly every every city could use one on every block or something. <laughs> or a lovely thing to think you could just duck into a room and sit in silence. I mean, I, I do that when I travel. I find these little churches, and I go, and I just want to be away, and I just want to be quiet. Yes. And I'll, I'll, and I'll go in there every time I've been yeah. I'll, I'll go and next it's time. so nice. Yeah, yeah. They're like preserves, like the dark sky preserves that they have now, where there are no like, ambient light. You can have silent preserves everywhere. Yeah. I was wondering if you looked into all Christian um, monasteries and convents, or if you looked at other um, belief systems. The or, Eastern. Or, yeah, and if you saw any differences between the silence within those. You know, I thought about that, and then I thought, 
the book would become, you know, I, to, 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 to give do, you know, I didn't want to just, you know, talk about Eastern monasticism in a couple of paragraphs. I don't think that would have done it justice. So I had to make the decision um, to sort of, at the end, I do have Thomas, Thomas Merton does go to Asia, mm -hmm. and he meets with the Dalai Lama, and mm -hmm. so I have, I have part of that, his journey to Asia, but I couldn't take, it's, I thought that's for someone else and for another or book. Or the next book. Or the next book, yeah. <laughs> it would be interesting though. Yeah, yeah, it would be, and I do think there is a profound difference, and I realized that that would have, you know, required another hundred pages yeah. of the book and, and sort of take it out of alignment in a way. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, she said that um, in brain or injury conferences, they mm -hmm. always have a silent room. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. A, it's kind of amazing that, I, I, I mean, the acknowledgement, all these things, the UN, the brain injury conferences, are an acknowledgement of the power of silence to just yeah. set a place aside for it. And um, I, I guess was talking about even the area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. uh, as brain injury people, we need to be by ourselves all the time. Right, to an right. extent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true even of um, my autistic nephew who mm -hmm. needs, you know, who wears earphones sometimes right. because he can't the stimulation of the world around him is too much, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that also the, um, like the art department and publication studio, all they need to get away from the world. Right. I, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I, let, let's start a movement of having little spaces for silence on every block. <laughs> As I listen to you, I notice that one of you talks about two different situations where people are silent and alone, which is isolation. And one of you talks about a Quaker meeting, which I've never been to. And I don't really, I'd like you to explain to me the nature of coming together as a large group of people to not speak. What? You can do that at home. But <laughs> <laughs> it feels like why that's different, or yeah. that's different. Yeah. Um, I, actually, I, I actually brought with me a, a quote from Thomas Kelly, who's a Quaker writer about uh, the experience of silence in Quaker meeting. And uh, we, we call it a meeting where the silence is particularly deep, a gathered meeting. In the Quaker practice of group worship on the basis of silence come special times when the electric hush and solemnity and depth of power steals over the worshipers. A blanket of divine covering comes over the room and a quickening presence pervades us. Breaking down some part of the special privacy and isolation of our individual lives and bonding our spirit within a super individual life and power. An objective dynamic presence which enfolds us all, nourishes our souls, speaks glad unutterable comfort within us and quickens in us depths that before had been slumbering. The burning bush has been kindled in our midst, and we stand together on holy ground. And uh, there, there, is something, <laughs> there is something different that happens when we, when we are, um, uh, invite silence as a community, and, and not just 
serve on our own. Uh, yeah? I was just curious about silence and deaf people, especially like a child or first born who's not hearing. That's also one of the silences I didn't take. People always ask about that. No, you're not the first one. And I, it's another thing. That's another book for, um, you know, you could write a whole book on that experience as well. Yeah. I mean, there are so many layers of experience with silence. Well, I, I was just going to add to uh, comments about the Quaker meeting. One of the reasons that silence works there is that people come ready to listen. So the silence is not just few I can s escape, which it is in some ways, uh, but it's also what might come to me out of the silence. What might I hear in my head or in my body or from someone that's there. So doing it in a group then with that intent is I think a different, gives it a different quality than sitting at home alone. Or you can also do it, but it's just an addition. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you look at the, the connection between silence and loneliness? Mm -hmm. Loneliness seems to be really an important mm -hmm. aspect of modern life these days. And yeah. it's the loneliness. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that comes through when I talk about the prison experience because I think inextricable from Charles Williams and the other prisoners experience was a profound loneliness of that and how that um, it wore on them and that, that sense of isolation and um, not having another to um, close to them there. Yeah. So that that weaves through, I think, the, the uh, the penitentiary segments of the book. Mm. I mean, I you know the interesting thing to me is that the, si the silence is extremely powerful, and I think at all times it holds both its positive and negatives together. Mm -hmm. And that you know the the you know because it's very mysterious, and that um, you know it can feel very enriching one day and feel like torture the next. Mm -hmm. and, and Um, out of time. Yeah. We do have time for more questions, but um, there are maybe a couple more questions. <coughs> uh, you said you didn't go deep into the uh, Eastern philosophies at this time, you know, but <laughs> did you look at other cultures and have to know something that I think we may all assume, that every culture could recognize some of what you're talking about here? Is there some culture where they would say, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> where there seems to be such similarities between some enforced silence when you remove some from society, some enforced silence when you're in society, and yeah. silence sought as something that's contemplative and restorative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't go beyond the Western tradition. You know, I, I stuck to the experience in Europe and the United States because that also is the penitentiary tradition and the Western monastic tradition, so that it's it, it sort of circulates around there. But that's a good, I mean, that's a really interesting angle to find out if that was the same, um, you know, whether it would be the same in, in all cultures. I, I couldn't say yes or no confidently about that. So. There is a website that lists a hundred books on silence. <laughs> I think it's a really good, uh, I think it's called Encountering Silence, and it's really uh, interesting. <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean, I think there's some aspect of it that's just the human experience as opposed right. to a cultural. Right, right. right. And you know, different cultures, we ourselves, I mean, a contemporary American culture, I think, um, is a culture of isolation more than others, you know? I remember I had a friend who joined the Peace Corps and went to Ecuador, and you know, he came to the, he, he was in the village and they sent him off to his quarters, and they said, would you like somebody to be with you, to stay with you for company? I mean, you know, they didn't want to leave him alone because that seemed like a, such an um, abnormality to be living alone. Yeah. Whereas we, you know, in our culture now, most of us, a majority, I think, of Americans live alone. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. 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 
What, what's your next topic or project or what are you working on next? <laughs> well, I, you know, I haven't had much time in the last few months to, to but I am, I, I, What's I, mulling around in your head? What's what I think I'm going to write about is, um, and this will be historical and have research, but it will be more personal, about um, how single women inhabit their homes mm -hmm. and how single, you know, the history of it, how someone in the 19th century, a single woman in the 19th century was in a very different social world than I am yes. and, yes. and have much more limited freedoms and yes. how, it, how that experience has changed over time and over cultural changes. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I, it's, I think it'll be really interesting I think it'll be a challenge to find, I think there's a lot of um, letters and diaries from middle class and upper middle class women, more of a challenge to find, mm -hmm. say, working class women. Yeah. 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 So, that would be interesting. Yeah. It might be hard for them to afford to live alone. Yeah. Or forced really to live alone. Yeah. You know, oh. and my house in Brunswick, there was a widow there in oh, 1900, okay. so okay. it's kind yeah. of an interesting, um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think many young women lived alone, but that's older women lived alone. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you all.